In yesterday's video, we discussed card advantage, but some of you guys were asking questions about cards that might not necessarily generate immediate card advantage, but that have potential benefits, maybe if they're in the graveyard or because of their ability to cycle for other cards, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. What's going on guys, it's Simo. So today we're going to be doing a discussion about virtual card advantage. Now, if you have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to card advantage, I highly recommend checking out yesterday's video about card advantage, and I'll have that link in the description below because that video is more so a precursor to this more advanced video. But today we're gonna to be discussing virtual card advantage. Now you're probably questioning, what the fuck is virtual card advantage? Well, virtual card advantage might not necessarily grant you immediate card advantage in the terms of plus ones or plus twos or anything like that, but it actually changes the values of certain cards that either player may have at their disposal. So this pretty much goes with a theory that not all cards are equal in terms of their design. Let me give you a quick example. One good example of this is that grass looks greener. Now that grass looks greener in terms of card advantage theory is a minus one because you're activating the card, you're milling the difference between your deck and your opponent's deck, and then you send it to the graveyard so you are in fact losing a card. However, the virtual card advantage that you gain from activating a card like that grass looks greener is absurd because you're milling potentially 15, 20, sometimes even more cards, and there's a ton of cards in the game that have benefits that activate or trigger or anything like that once they're in the graveyard. So even though the immediate card advantage isn't there upon activating that grass looks greener, the potential virtual card advantage is there because of all the benefits of throwing a third of your deck into the graveyard by obtaining all of those cards. So we're going to be going a little bit more in depth with virtual card advantage by breaking it down into four specific categories. Those categories are card selection, recurring effects, tempo and denying card effects or pretty much card value or just making cards dead in general. A lot of this comes from a lot of Magic the Gathering theory, but I'm going to kind of take it and apply it in Yu-Gi-Oh! context because there's a lot that can really be discussed and analyzed here. So, starting off with card selection. So card selection, when it comes to virtual card advantage, essentially means a being able to influence the cards that you can either draw or add from your deck to your hand. So one of the most pretty much known examples of this would be Pot of Duality. In terms of regular card advantage, Pot of Duality is a simple neutral or you break even because you're activating the card, you're picking one of three cards and adding it to your hand. So you're using a card and getting a new one. The thing is though, where the virtual card advantage comes in is the fact that you have the ability to choose from the top three cards of your deck. And that actually makes a significant difference, especially when you start getting into the mathematics and probability of it, because depending on your deck size, depending on how many cards of a certain copy of a card you're looking for in your deck, it matters a lot than compared to something like Upstart Goblin, which is just drawing the top card of your deck, Pot of Duality granting you the ability to look at the top three cards of your deck actually makes a significant difference in terms of virtual card advantage because it's expanding your options and allowing you to dig deeper without while still gaining the same amount of cards when it comes to card advantage. And that really can matter depending on the type of deck that you're playing. Another example of this would be Reinforcement of the Army. Again, it's a simple one for one or a neutral or breaking even. You're using Reinforcement of the Army to add yourself a warrior from deck to hand. Thing is though, you're able to search your entire deck, which is probably gonna be comprised of warrior monsters or a specific warrior monster that you're trying to tutor into and allowing you to immediately access that card. So you're increasing the value of the cards because you're turning a card that really wouldn't do much into something that's essentially maybe a fourth or fifth or sixth copy of a card you're already playing three of in your deck, increasing the chances that you're gonna see that card more often and bolstering consistency. 
see. So that's why virtual card advantage matters so much, especially not only in Yu-Gi-Oh, but really in any card game in general. Next up is recurring effects. Now recurring effects, it just plain and simple, is cards that you can use multiple times off of one card. And this is really big in Yu-Gi-Oh compared to other card games, because in other card games, they usually have a resource system, like a mana system or something like that, which requires you to use that resource in order to gain the effects of those cards multiple times. Well, Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't really have that, and that's what's really crazy, because you take a look at a card like, say, for instance, Dragonic Diagram. Dragonic Diagram, even though, you know, pretty much you're getting value off of it every single turn, if your opponent doesn't directly deal with the Dragonic Diagram, they're gonna have the ability to keep triggering it, possibly bolt, uh, possibly hitting cards in their hand or on their field that trigger when they're destroyed or hit the graveyard, adding cards to their hand and triggering those effects. And if your opponent doesn't stop it, it's a resource that you can use multiple times. So from a card advantage standpoint, even though sometimes these cards might break even or maybe force a plus one, if it's a plus one every single turn, that's a really big deal. Take a look at a card like Spiral Resort. Spiral Resort, you're adding a card to your hand every Every single turn if your opponent doesn't deal with it. So over the course of a game, if it goes into a medium or a, a late game, you're going to be able to get so much card advantage off of it that even though by itself it just might be a simple plus one, and even though it does have susceptibility to being stopped by spot removal, you have the ability to gain multiple cards off of it. So one card is actually worth several when you're looking at it from a perspective of card advantage. Another example would be something like in a Interrupted Kaiju Slumber, or anything that has a graveyard specific trigger. Upon activation, Kaiju Slumber is going to wipe the board and give both players some Kaijus. And more often than not, you're going to be in the advantageous position in this case, and you're going to be able to deal with their Kaiju, I'd say probably nine times out of ten. But the advantage is on a later turn, Interrupted Kaiju Slumber because a card that you're going to banish from your graveyard to add a Kaiju from your deck to your hand, being able to deal with another one of your opponent's threats. Another card would be like Breakthrough Skill. Breakthrough Skill can negate the activation of an opposing player's monster, but then when it's in the graveyard, it can also do the same thing and do that during your own turn. So even though it's one card, it has the ability to negate two separate effects, essentially kind of breaking the mold of card advantage theory because even though it doesn't really, it's kind of a minus one because you're just negating the effect of that monster. You get two uses out of it. So that kind of provides more intrinsic value for the card itself, especially maybe in your deck building process when you're trying to decide which cards you want to play over one another. The third instance is Tempo. Now Tempo is a little bit weird in Yu-Gi-Oh because Tempo doesn't really exist because there isn't really like curving out like there is in other games. And because Yu-Gi-Oh games can end very quickly, sometimes on turn two, actually a lot of the times on turn two, tempo is kind of really hard to measure. But one of the best examples would be in a Zodiac match. And I know Zodiac's pretty much on the chopping block, but hear me out for this example. If you're a Zodiac player and you're going first, you're more than likely going to establish a Dryden turn one. Then on your following turn, even if your Dryden gets destroyed, through the effect of Zodiac Chalkanine, you're able to resurrect your first Dryden, and then you're able to put a material under it with Tiger Mortar and make a second Dryden as well. So now your opponent on turn two has to deal with two Drydens. And in terms of tempo, that gives you a really substantial lead because if your opponent doesn't have a board wipe or a way to deal with both copies of Dryden, they're essentially having to lose two cards that they already have in their hand. And if those two cards are their only means of playing, playing the game and the rest of the cards in their hand are worthless, then that's pretty much all you need in terms of tempo to be able to outpace your opponent, which is why you see in Zodiac Mirror matches why Double Dryden is essentially game over, because most of the time players can't really outdo two copies of Zodiac Dryden. Now another example of tempo might be something like Masterpiece the True Draco Slaying King. I know we're pretty much hitting on all the overpowered cards, but again, just for example's sake. So Masterpiece is another good example of tempo because if you're able to establish Masterpiece on the field early enough, if your opponent doesn't have a way to out it, 
And then it doesn't matter about the amount of cards that they have at their disposal because they have a 2950 masterpiece sitting on the field that's immune to two different types of effects more often than not. And that being the case, your opponent can have seven cards or sometimes nine cards. And if they don't have that out from a tempo perspective, that puts you very far ahead in the game because you're going to have this invulnerable monster that they're not going to be able to deal with. And it's going to put you in an advantageous position. And this kind of leads into the fourth instance, which is denying card value as well as pretty much forcing dead cards. This is something where if you really have the ability to make cards at your opponent's disposal dead, then that puts you at an advantage because even though your opponent has more cards than you, if those cards aren't applicable to a certain situation they're trying to deal with, then it doesn't matter how many cards they have and then card advantage becomes meaningless. Again, referencing Masterpiece, the true Draco Slaying King, if they have 10 or 12 cards at their disposal and none of them can handle Masterpiece, then it doesn't matter how many of those cards that they have because they can't deal with your threat. Another instance of this would be, let's say you have a hand of Fire Formation Tanky, two copies of Shuffle Reborn, My Body is a Shield, and Soul Charge. Well, if you use that Fire Formation Tanky, and let's say your opponent stops that card, now you have no way to use any of the cards in the rest of your hand because you have no monsters in your graveyard and my body as a shield isn't protecting you from anything because you never established a monster. So basically, even though you have four additional cards at your disposal, whether that tanky was stopped with something like a Dryadent or a Mystical Space Typhoon or an Ash Blossom, you now have a hand of entirely dead cards and your opponent has denied you all of the value of those cards, even though they might generally be very strong if your opponent plays their cards correctly they can deny all of those cards in your hand having any value whatsoever and you're going to have a completely worthless hand and be at a disadvantage so that's pretty much all it boils down to when it comes to virtual card advantage it's kind of looking at the true value of the cards not necessarily from a zero-sum game of pluses and minuses like in card advantage theory but more so the intrinsic value that each card has on its its own and the potential it has to provide you maybe over the course of a few turns or maybe the raw power that the card has because it's immune to card effects or because of how it can disrupt its opponent. There's a plethora of different abilities that can add to the value of a card, but that's really up to you to distinguish on your very own. So guys, thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video really helpful, consider backing me on Patreon because just by pledging only $1 a month, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time. One, two, three.